So good afternoon, everyone. Today in my session, I'm going to discuss in detail about the latest guidelines on PCOS. These are the international evidence-based guidelines for the assessment and management of PCOS as released by the European Society of Endocrinology and also endorsed by the Endocrine Society. Uh, so definitely a very important set of guidelines for the upcoming European board exam in November and all specialty board exams and also other endocrine board exams. Uh, in terms of... Uh, other guidelines, which I'll be covering in my subsequent lectures, I'll try to do a guideline on adrenal incidentaloma uh, based on the European Society of Guidelines, of Endocrinology Guidelines. Uh, then I'll be trying to do a session on the immune checkpoint inhibition. I already have one session in my lecture series for this, but in this particular session, I'll try to cover the European Society of Endocrinology Guidelines. And then I'll be doing one session on the clinical practice guidelines on functioning and non-functioning pituitary adenomas in pregnancy. In addition to this, I will also like to share with you all uh, some of my other upcoming lectures. So you already had heard the free view of SC 2023 recall. The full session will be available to the paid subscribers. There'll be one full session of top images for the SCE, the European board exam and clinical practice. Uh, there'll be a session on diabetic foot ulcer and charcoal's foot. Uh, there will be a detailed session on Turner syndrome, where I'll be covering the Cincinnati clinical practice guidelines, which is also endorsed by the Endocrine Society. I'll be doing a session on endocrine emergencies, quick review, uh, MEN2 syndrome, approach and screening and follow-up, diabetic neuropathy. We'll also be doing a full recall on SCE 2022 exam. Exam lab questions and answers, uh, the full 200 questions will be available to the paid subscribers. The, there will be another session on phase space approach to the management of endocrine disorders in pregnancy. Now, just to share with you all also the uh, current uh, lecture series. So these are uh, currently the lectures which are available on uh, my paid subscription. Uh, there are around 63 lectures, so including this, it will become 64. Uh, they are extremely helpful for the appearing for the endocrinology exams as well as in clinical practice. So if you want to subscribe to the full lecture series, you can WhatsApp me on my number, which is 0097155743 or you can email me on mazirules at gmail.com. Again, uh, there are almost 17 videos on diabetes different topics I've covered in my lecture series, all guideline-based, all case-based. In terms of uh, high-yield topics, uh, these are uh, high-yield for the exam. There are topics on thyroid, adrenal. There'll be quick revision for exams. There are three parts there. There is also previous exam recalls. And there's also from the Oxford Handbook Pearls, the latest edition, which is the fourth edition, and the exam lab questions as well. Thyroid wise, also, there is a good number of videos, almost six videos covering all the important topics asked in the exams. There is uh, adrenal, around six videos, again, covers all the range of adrenal topics which appear in the exam. Uh, there is two sessions on lab endocrinology. There is seven videos on pituitary, again, covering all the important topics which have been appeared in the exam. And uh, there is three videos on inherited endocrine syndromes. I was mentioning to you about the immune checkpoint inhibitor, so it's definitely go through this uh, video as well, and I'll be covering the European board guidelines as well for that. Reproductive endocrinology wise, there is uh, almost around uh, six videos covering different topics. Here I have covered in detail the PCOS case based approach. Uh, one is evaluation and diagnosis, and also treatment by also covering the different uh, causes and the treatment of the hirsutism as well. So here we had taken into incorporation the endocrine society guidelines, which were then published. And then uh, this uh, also is case-based. So it's important for you to go in detail through these two lectures before you go on to the latest guidelines. Then uh, there are three videos on calcium and metabolic metabolism, again, covering the important topics. There is a very important session on familial lipid disorders, uh, pediatric endocrinology as well. So these are all the lectures which are currently available in the lecture series. And I also showed you the upcoming lectures, which will be of great benefit to you all in the clinical practice, as well as for appearing for the different exams. So now let's start with the session on uh, 
PCOS or the recommendations from the 2023 International Evidence-Based Guidelines for the assessment and management of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And as I mentioned to you, these have been endorsed by the Endocrine Society guidelines as well. And of course, they were released by the European Society of Endocrinology just very recently in August 2023. So a bit of introduction, PCOS is most common endocrinopathy affecting reproductive age women with impacts across the lifespan from adolescence to postmenopause. PCOS prevalence is between 10 and 13% as confirmed in the guideline process. So one of the important MCQs which can appear in the exams. Etiology is complex. Clinical presentation is heterogeneous with reproductive, metabolic, and psychological features. Women internationally experience delayed diagnosis and dissatisfaction with the claim. So clinical practice and assessment and management of PCOS remains inconsistent with ongoing key evidence practice gaps. And that's the aim of these guidelines to try and fill this gap. Following on from the 2018 international based guidelines, which were discussed in my previous session of PCOS, where I showed you in my lecture series about the diagnosis, evaluation, and the treatment of parasitism and PCOS. This is a further extension to that, this guidelines. Hence, I definitely recommend you to listen to those two lectures. And that particular lecture was case-based. In this session, it's more of the guideline overview. That was fully case-based session. And uh, our aim is to update, extend, and translate rigorous, comprehensive, evidence-based guidelines for diagnosis, assessment, and treatment so that we can improve the lives of those with PCOS worldwide. So about the diagnostic algorithm for PCOS, uh, this is what is the, as per the latest guidelines. So if there are irregular cycles plus clinical hyperandrogenism, okay, then just exclude the other causes. So what are the other causes? Exclusion of other causes. So thyroid, uh, do a TSH, do a prolactin, do a 17-hydroxy progesterone to rule out uh, non-classical CH, do an FSH or others if clinical indicated like ruling out Cushing's and adrenal tumors. If other causes are excluded, and if the patient has irregular cycles plus clinically hyperandrogenic, this is diagnostic of PCOS. What is the second criteria? If no clinical hyperandrogenism, but if test for biochemical hyperandrogenism is positive and we have excluded the other causes, again, the diagnosis is PCOS. So either step one, step two, or step three is if the patient has only irregular cycles or hyperandrogenism, okay, very important, if the patient is an adolescent, then ultrasound is not indicated. We should consider this patient's at risk of PCOS and then reassess them later at adulthood. If it is an adult with only irregular cycles or hyperandrogenism, then we should definitely request for an ultrasound. And if the ultrasound shows a polycystic ovarian morphology, then that leads to a diagnosis of PCOS. Of course, in all these three scenarios, we will exclude the other causes, as I mentioned above. So this is... Uh, further to the Rotterdam criteria, we were all aware of the Rotterdam criteria before, but this is endorsed in the latest guidelines. So any one of them can lead to a diagnosis of PCOS, provided uh, we have excluded the other causes and we satisfy the criteria, which is mentioned in the step one, step two, and the step three. Let's move on. Now, each and everything has been defined subsequently. So irregular cycles, what do they mean by irregular cycles? What do they mean by biochemical hyperandrogenism? And what do they mean by clinical hyperandrogenism? And what do they mean by the polycystic morphology and ultrasound? So all these steps, the individual definitions are very important to understand. And that is what we are going to look at in the uh, next set of slides. So irregular menstrual cycles, normal in the first year, uh, post menarche, and uh, this is basically the pubertal transition. So this is normal to have irregular menstrual cycles in the first year post menarche, and that is a sign of pubertal transition. Greater than one to less than three years post menarche, or basically less than 21 days or more than 45 days is termed as irregular cycles. Greater than three years post menarche to perimenopause, if it is less than 21 or more than 35 days, or less than eight cycles per year is termed as irregular cycles. So each and every uh, entity here is irregular cycle, but this definition should start. Greater than one year post menarche or greater than 90 days for any one cycle. This is again classed as irregular menstrual cycle. Primary amenorrhea by age of 15 
or greater than three years post thalarchy, which is breast development, is also classed as irregular menstrual cycle. So any one of them is a regular menstrual cycle, provided they satisfy the things which is mentioned. So with irregular cycles, PCOS should be considered and assessed according to the clinical guidelines. Ovulatory dysfunction can occur with regular cycles as well. If an ovulation is suspected, then they recommend to check the progesterone levels. Now, as I saw, as I told you in the main diagnostic algorithm here, for adolescents who have got features of PCOS, but who do not meet criteria diagnostic, they are considered at increased risk and should be considered and reassessed uh, when they are uh, at or before full reproductive maturity, which is usually eight years post menarche This also includes those with PCOS features before uh, combined oral contraceptive pill was commenced. Those with persistent features and those with significant weight gain in adolescent. So this is very important to consider in context of adolescent. So if adolescents ultrasound, that is not indicated. And you should consider these individuals at risk of PCS and then reassess later at adulthood, or which is eight years post menarche. What is biochemical hyperandrogenism as per the diagnostic algorithm? Use total testosterone and free testosterone for diagnosis. If not elevated, then androstenedione and dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate should be measured, but they are less specific with a limited role in the PCOS diagnosis. Highly accurate tandem mass spectrometry, which is LCMS or MSSAs, are recommended for measuring of these uh, parameters. This is very important from exam perspective. Direct free testosterone, USAs are not preferred. Use lab reference ranges. Reliable assessment of biochemical hyperandrogenism, not possible on hormonal contraception. If the patient is on OC pills, not reliable to measure these uh, parameters. Consider withdrawal for at least greater than or equal to three months with alternative contraception method during this time before we go for testing again uh, in this scenario. Biochemical hyperandrogenism role is when clinical hyperandrogenism is unclear. When levels are well above lab reference range, other causes should be considered. So if we got a very high testosterone level, we should definitely consider other causes. History of symptom onset, progression is key in assessing for neoplasia, However, some androgen secreting neoplasms may only include mild to induce mild to moderate increase in hyperandrogen. This is something which we should keep in mind. Now, androgen levels are markedly above the lab reference range. Causes of hyperandrogenemia other than PCOS should be considered, like ovarian and adrenal neoplastic growth, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Cushing syndrome, ovarian hyperthecosis, usually it happens after menopause, hydrogenic causes. And syndromes of severe insulin resistance should also be considered. However, some androgen secreting neoplasm, as I mentioned, can only induce mild to moderate increase in androgen levels. That's why clinical history of the time of the onset and or the rapid progression of symptoms is critical in assessing for an androgen secreting. Let's move on to the clinical hyperandrogenism. Comprehensive history and physical examination is needed. We should examine the adults for acne, female pattern, hair loss, and hirsutism. Adolescence uh, for severe acne and hirsutism. Note, negative psychosocial impact of clinical hyperandrogenism. Patient perception is very important, regardless of the apparent clinical severity. Standardized visual scales are preferred, including the modified ferryman galway scale uh, score for assessing for hirsutism, and a score of more than or equal to four to six is indicative of hirsutism. Noting self-treatment impacts assessment. So we should make sure if the patient was doing any laser or any other cosmetic tool. Ludwig visual score is preferred for assessing female pattern hair loss. Again, a very important statement for exam perspective. Even the modified ferryman galway score for arcitism assessment and Ludwig visual score preferred for assessing female pattern hair loss. Note that new onset severe or worsening hyperandrogenism including hirsutism, requires further investigation to rule out an androgen secreting tumor and ovarian hypertrophy. What about the ultrasound polycystic ovarian morphology? With irregular menstrual cycles and hyperandrogenism, an ovarian ultrasound is not necessary for diagnosis. That's very clear. If you have irregular menstrual cycle already and hyperandrogenism, 
then no need to even bother doing an ovarian ultrasound. In diagnosis, follicle number per ovary is most affected, followed by follicular number per cross section and ovarian volume as ultrasound markers in adults. Ultrasound should not be used for PCOS diagnosis in adolescents. Again, I'm repeating here because this will be asked in the exam for sure, due to a high incidence of multifollicular ovaries in this life stage. This is the reason why it is not recommended in the diagnostic criteria. Transvaginal ultrasound approach is usually preferred in diagnosis of PCOS if sexually active or if acceptable to the individual ovary. Using ultrasound transducers with frequency bandwidth, including 8 MHZ, the polycystic ovarian morphology threshold is a follicular number per ovary of more than or equal to 20 and or an ovarian volume of more than or equal to 10 ml on either ovary. Avoiding corpora lutea, cyst or dominant follicle. This is very, very important. Serum AMH could be used for defining PCOS. I'll do it. Uh, I'll explain this in the next slides. In adults, as an alternative to pelvic ultrasound, this is included in spatial guideline. Either serum AMH or ultrasound may be used, but not both to avoid an overdiagnosis. So we'll be talking about the AMH in this particular slide. With that, that's the end of my review. Uh, if you like to access the full session on these guidelines, I uh, request you to subscribe to my lecture series, as I already mentioned to you all in my initial uh, part of this session. Thank you so much.